This is Office Hours at Duke University. Today's conversation is with Janan Reed. Professor Reed is an associate professor of sociology and global health. Her research includes uh, assimilation experiences of Arab Americans and U.S. Muslims. She's also a Carnegie scholar. She is author of the book Culture, Class, and Work Among Arab American Women. This year at Duke, she will be teaching a course on U.S. health disparities. Viewers can join this Duke Office Hours conversation in three ways, by emailing live at duke.edu, visiting the Duke University Facebook page, or using the Twitter tag, Duke Live. Professor Reed, we're here at your office hours. Today is obviously September 11. It's hard to ignore the significance of the date. But you want to put a kind of disclaimer on using the day to talk about Muslims in America. What's the word of caution that you would offer? Well, first, let me thank you for having me on today. I told my class earlier this morning that I was going to have live office hours, and the only way they could join me was to Twitter or email in. So hopefully they're uh, participating in my office hours right now. Um, yeah, I have to say I actually hesitated when I was asked to come on today because it was 9-11. Because on the one hand, uh, I was a little bit worried that it might actually reify the stereotype that Muslim Americans, which is the group that I study, um, are synonymous with terrorists, given the significance of today. Um, at the same time, I felt obligated to come on and share some of the research I've been doing over the past 10 years, prior to 9-11 even, on the assimilation of Arab and Muslim Americans to maybe help dispel some misconceptions and clarify questions that people have. So I'm hoping uh, people join in the conversation with us today. Very good. Now, one piece of news on Muslims in America that came out just this week is a Pew Forum poll showing that on average, Americans believe Muslims are the most discriminated against religious group in the country. Does that surprise you? It, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't in the sense that research over the past seven or eight years has shown that most Americans view Muslims as the group that is most not like themselves, uh, second only to atheists. So, you know, we know that Americans don't view Muslims as a group that's similar to them. What surprises me a little bit is the fact that they're so aware that they're so discriminated against. Uh, we know from the research that's been done since 9-11 that Muslim Americans have been the victims of uh, race-based, ethnic-based uh, hate crimes. Uh, but the fact that it's so widely acknowledged and known was a little bit surprising to me. Very good. Now, that same Pew poll also showed that a significant minority of Americans, about a third, believe that Islam encourages violence more than other faiths. What do you make of that attitude? Well, I think that the Pew form actually showed that that's dropped a little bit since 9-11, or at least stayed the same. So in some sense, there's not been a, a huge wave or movement toward people believing that Muslims or Islam encourages violence. Another thing that came out of the Pew Forum that I thought was very interesting that could be read a couple of different ways was the fact that most Americans uh, consider Islam to be very different from their own religion. And at first you might think, well, that just goes to prove the fact that they don't know very much about Islam because uh, theologians would argue perhaps that the three major monotheistic religions have a lot more in common than they have uh, in disagreement. Uh, but at the same time, the, uh, the Pew Forum actually also showed that most Americans think that way about other religions as well, not just Islam, about Catholicism and Mormonism. So to be fair, I think uh, most Americans don't know about other religions, period, and it's not just about Islam. But that goes to speak to what the, the Pew Forum, the, the poll actually also showed, which I've been talking about for the past five or six years, is that the one way to overcome some of the common misconceptions about Muslim Americans is the same uh, avenue that you would have to overcome misconceptions about other groups that people don't know much about, and that is with social contact. So the the for, the poll from Pew actually also showed that the people who knew Muslims were the least likely to think that Islam encouraged violence and had the most favorable view of uh, Islam and of Muslims. So that sort of social contact helped break down some of the barriers and the misconceptions, I think, that are generalized to the population at large. Viewers can join this Duke Office Hours conversation in three ways. 
by email to live at duke.edu, visiting the Duke University Facebook page, or using the Twitter tag, Duke Live. Professor Reed, you mentioned um, ways of influencing Americans' attitudes about Muslim Americans. And of course, both Presidents Bush and Obama since 9-11 have made public states affirming the Muslim community. Are there significant milestones with those statements? And is there any way to say if they've been effective? I think the effectiveness of their statement waxes and wanes. Uh, immediately after President Bush uh, made the statement that we shouldn't confuse ordinary mainstream Muslims with a handful of heinous uh, terrorists that committed the crimes on September 11, 2001, there was a, 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 a huge movement away from believing that all Muslims are bad in the U.S. A, a, a poll showed that. At the same time, the further you get away from some of the statements that both President Bush and President Obama made, Made, you start to see people going back to the middle a little bit and not necessarily seeing Muslims as uh, a part of the American mainstream. So President Obama recently made a statement about treating uh, Muslims with respect, and he was referring to the hijab and the fact that we should uphold religious freedoms in this country. Uh, at the same time, we have lawsuits that are ongoing right now uh, against wearing the hijab. There are some states who've actually implemented uh, different policies or at least trying to pass legislation uh, that uh, limits accommodations to Muslims in terms of their religious practices, their religious beliefs. So I think it's really mixed, and the effectiveness of what they say has to be backed up with some policies and legislation that actually protects uh, groups such as Muslim Americans and not just give sort of the lip service. Very good. Viewers can join this Duke Office Hours conversation in three ways by emailing live at duke.edu, visiting the Duke University Facebook page, or using the Twitter tag, Duke Live. Now, Professor Reed, what about in your own research? Are there misperceptions that Americans in general have about Muslim Americans? Are there some that stand out? You know, there's a couple of different misperceptions. One, in, in a way, sort of speaks to the fact that I'm here today on September 11th talking about Muslim Americans. And that one misperception is the idea that being a Muslim is the most important identity to all Muslims, and that, that they wake up in the morning and identify first and foremost as a Muslim and not a mother or a father or a woman or a student. Um, so this sort of, uh, we've constructed this other group as Muslim that is very diverse, just like other religious and ethnic groups in the United States today. So one of the things that my research tries to highlight is the actual diversity that exists within the Muslim American population. And I'd like to point out three ways in which that has um, been really important for me to sort of highlight that surprises most people. The first is in terms of their racial and ethnic diversity. There's a lot of confusion over who is Muslim and who is Arab. So in the simplest terms, you know, being a Muslim is a religious affiliation. Being an Arab is an ethnic affiliation. And there is some overlap in that, uh, particularly in other parts of the world. But in the United States, what we see is that most Muslims in America are actually South Asian, uh, a large proportion are African American, and really sort of a smaller minority are Arab American. So part of what I've tried to do is illustrate the difference between religion, ethnicity, where they overlap, and where they're very distinct. So that's on one aspect of their diversity. A second really important one is in terms of the religiosity. Saying that someone is a Muslim is a category that's just labeling their religious affiliation, much like saying that someone is Jewish or someone is Christian. But just as in with Judaism and Christianity, there's a wide diversity in how religious Muslims are. So you have very secular Muslims who are Muslim in name only in, in somewhat almost a more cultural sense. And then you have very devout Muslim, Muslim who attend the mosque and who um, observe Ramadan. But even am in, among the most devout, that has nothing to do with religious extremism. Um, so there's a wide range of diversity in the Muslim American population with, uh, in terms of religiosity, which is, again, very similar to other religious groups in the U.S. Uh, then the third aspect that I highlight that's important in terms of where we are in our economy and political situation today is in the socioeconomic and political uh, diversity that exists within the Muslim American community. 
By and large, it's an affluent population uh, due to the selective immigration of Muslims from certain countries, due to restrictive immigration policies that limit who can actually come into the United States. So what we see is not a random selection of Muslims from different parts of the world, but a very fairly affluent and mobile group. Of course, at the same time, there are also Muslim refugees from countries that are coming here from war-torn places. So there's diversity on that front as well. So I just, you know, one of the most important things I think is to understand that being a Muslim is just a label and that we have to dig past that label if we're going to understand who this group is and where they fit into the American milieu. Very good. Viewers can join this Duke Office Hours conversation in three ways. By emailing live at duke.edu, visiting the Duke University Facebook page, or using the Twitter tag, Duke Live. We have a question by email here from Jeffrey, who writes, What, if any, are the major sociological differences between Muslim communities in the U.S. and those in Europe where there has been significant disenfranchisement, political radicalism, and backlash against the community? That's a great question, Jeffrey, and it really dovetails in with what I was just saying about the socioeconomic diversity of the Muslim American community. From a sociological perspective, one of the most important things to understand in terms of the difference between the Muslim communities in Europe and the Muslim communities here, where did they originate from? Who are these people? It's not like, you know, I joke when I teach classes on immigration. It's not like immigrants were dropped in from outer space from a spaceship, right? They came from somewhere. So understanding a little bit about where the sending countries were. So what we know about the differences between the Muslim American populations in Europe, and of course, I don't want to overgeneralize. There's a lot of diversity there. But let's say France, for example, where I've done some work, is that they tend to be of lower socioeconomic status. They tend to be in poverty. And so a lot of the things that were happening in France around the riots were very much tied up with uh, the impoverishment and employment rates uh, and less to do with Islam per se than with uh, just the fact that they were in, you know, rioting against the fact that there were no jobs. So the Muslim communities in Europe, demographically, in terms of their age structure, the countries they come from, their um, educational attainment levels, their employment backgrounds, they look very different than the Muslim populations and communities here in the United States. Great question. Viewers can join this Duke Office Hours conversation in three ways. By emailing live at duke.edu, visiting the Duke University Facebook page, or using the Twitter tag Duke Live. We've got an email question here from Lucy who asks, there has been a lot of talk about pulling out of Iraq and Afghanistan. What happens? What will be the impact on the Muslim world? So foreign policy, we're in the, in the realm of foreign policy, Professor Reed. Well, I think it depends on a lot of things, but one, it depends on how we pull out of Afghanistan and Iraq. I mean, the legacy that we leave behind can be just as strong in terms of how we leave the countries as how we entered the countries. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there to do things the right way and to sort of mend relations uh, in the Middle East and throughout the world in terms of how we're viewed when we sort of go into other countries and disrupt other uh, countries. So it really depends on how we come out of those countries. I think there's a lot of uh, room to be gained in terms of mending uh, the image that the United States has with the rest of the world uh, in terms of our leaving Afghanistan and Iraq. And I'm hoping, as I'm sure a lot of people are, that we take the right steps to do that, and also to ensure the safety, of course, uh, of our troops. I mean, that's first and foremost at everyone's um, thoughts is how do we do this and also um, ensure the safety of our troops. Very good. Now, Professor Reed, that brings up the topic of uh, foreign policy and Muslim American versus American attitudes towards foreign policy. Much of your research shows similarities between Americans in general and Muslim Americans, but in this area of foreign policy, you do find some differences. What's, how do you describe that tension? Well, so the, let me first describe some of the similarities because I think they're shocking sometimes when I discuss this. I've often said that in many ways, Muslim Americans look a lot like evangelical Americans when it comes to their attitudes on the family and abortion and other sort of cultural issues that are uh, the hot button topics of the day, if you will. 
where we see some divergence in terms of attitudes uh, between Muslim Americans and other groups of Americans, although I would say the, the, the difference between the groups is becoming smaller and smaller each time there's a poll that's being done. But especially in the early 2000s, the biggest difference was that Muslim Americans were much more critical of U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East and throughout the world in part due to the fact that they had connections in those parts of the world, whereas most Americans do not. So by and large, I mean, if you have a connection with another part of the world, you're going to care more about it, and you're likely to be more critical of it. So the tension there was somewhat between the fact that they're living here in the United States, and most are U.S. citizens, most are Americans, um, the loyalty to being an American and the tension between that and the foreign policy they saw as being disruptive of other parts of the world in in many cases where they still have family. Very good. Viewers can join this Duke Office Hours conversation in three ways by emailing live at duke.edu, visiting the Duke University Facebook page, or using the Twitter tag Duke Live. Professor Reed, we've been talking about Muslims in America and within the Muslim community, the different identities that individual uh, Muslims have. And you actually did a study that tried to tease out this difference between Arab American and Muslim American by looking at two congregations. What, what were your conclusions there? Well, as I'd mentioned uh, earlier in the broadcast, I talked about the difference between a religious identity and an ethnic identity and how we tend to conflate those or treat them as one, that if you're Muslim, you're Arab, if you're Arab, you're Muslim, when in fact, um, Arab Americans, two-thirds, although the numbers are hard to know for sure because we don't really track religion in any large national database, but most Arab Americans are Christian, uh, not Muslim. And by Christian, I don't mean they came to the U.S. and converted to Christianity. What I mean by that is that they are of Eastern Orthodox faith. There's all sorts of different um, religious denominations within the Christian Arab American community. But what I was very interested in is how do Muslim Arabs and Christian Arabs view their identities, uh, particularly I was doing this study right after 9-11, and I wanted to see how they negotiated these conflicting identities. They were American, Christian, Muslim, living in a time when, uh, you know, being an Arab and being a Muslim was very difficult. Uh, and what I found was that, for the most part, the, the Christian Arabs could sort of blend more easily into mainstream culture than could the Muslim Arabs for all sorts of reasons. It wasn't just about their looks, but also about um, their belief systems and how they displayed their religiosity. Uh, and so the Muslim Americans were finding it much more difficult. Uh, this was in the year immediately following 9-11. Since that time, what I've been witnessing and tracking in my research on their political attitudes and behaviors is the fact that Muslim Americans, because they have a harder time Time sort of assimilating into mainstream culture because of the fact that they're now treated as the other group in American society. They can't really blend the way they did before 9-11. That this has served as a catalyst to help them mobilize politically. In other words, we've seen this happen time and time again in American history. When a group is marginalized, when they're discriminated against, one of the only ways they can have a voice be heard is to mobilize as a group to have a positive voice in what's going on in their country. So what we've seen is before 9-11, Muslim Americans were largely apolitical. In other words, they weren't um, highly politically motivated. But since that time, even since 2004, when by and large Muslim Americans voted for President Bush, since that time, you've seen greater levels of political mobilization on their part because they have realized that if they want to have a say in the policies and the legislation that affects them, then they have to have a legitimate voice speaking on their behalf. So, you know, the, the downside is the marginalization and discrimination hurts the, the community and hurts, you know, our country at large. I guess the upside is it has served as a catalyst to get them more involved in the American uh, political system. Very good. Viewers can join this Duke Office Hours conversation in three ways. By emailing live at duke.edu, visiting the Duke University Facebook page, or using the Twitter tag Duke Live. Professor Reed, you've been talking about Muslim Americans' uh, 
grouping together is a way to react to a certain amount of marginalization. Is it possible to talk about a Muslim America men agenda, a political agenda? I think it's a difficult thing to talk about at this point. I've said before that one way to strengthen our democracy is to bring Muslim Americans into the conversation. And I've been asked before, what does that mean? And I think what that means is that they have to feel like they're speaking in the conversation as a peer and not from the outside looking in. So continuously the debate is about whether or not Muslim Americans are like us, whether or not they can assimilate. And until we talk more about how to make Muslim Americans feel more a part of the process, you know, I don't think they have an agenda other than that they're constantly, from what I can tell, is having to defend off um, and be defensive. So to be a part of a conversation, they have to be able to be on the, not necessarily the offensive, but they have to be able to actually think about the things that affect them instead of always having to be reactionary. And I think that, that we haven't gotten to that point yet. So the agenda for now is to be a part of the conversation. So that's where I think it is. And that's why I said progress is slow since 9-11. It's been eight years, but I don't think uh, that Muslims are a part of the, the American conversation about democratic processes, not yet. Now, what about your own interest in this area of research? You've grown up in Libya and Egypt, but are not Muslim yourself. So how do you come to this uh, area of study? You know, it's interesting because uh, I have to think about this, but I wonder how often um, professors who study Christianity or Judaism have to uh, acknowledge or defend what their religious affiliation is. And I go back and forth on this. I'm not Muslim, but I grew up in a Muslim-majority country. I have a lot of friends that are Muslim. I know a lot about the religion. So, you know, part of me is like, well, I should have to say I am or I'm not a Muslim. But I find that as a, an academic, as a professor, as someone who's studied this area empirically, it's really important to differentiate between what I study and who I am. So I grew up in the Middle East, and I know a lot about Muslims, both abroad and here. And what I found and what sort of motivated the area of research that I'm in is that the reality of these people doesn't fit what people think they know about them. So it's, I've taken it on as my task is to sort of try to... Um, you know, not paint a rosy picture or not try to defend any group, but rather try to understand more about what is this group like? What are their experiences? What is their diversity? And sometimes my research is, doesn't, you know, paint a pretty picture of them. I look at gender roles and how that affects different outcomes among women in the U.S. So it's not always a positive um, view, but it's an academically based, empirically grounded um, attempt to understand a group that is continuously discussed but rarely understood. Very good. Viewers can join this Duke Office Hours conversation in three ways. By emailing live at duke.edu, visiting the Duke University Facebook page, or using the Twitter tag Duke Live. Professor Reed, you just mentioned gender roles in, in the Muslim community, and of course I think there's stereotypes out there about that. What does your research find about the role of women within the Muslim American community? Ironically, my research shows that, you know, gender roles within the Muslim American community actually fit more with the sort of American ideal of what the family should look like, uh, about a lot of our debates about the fact that, you know, you've got these kids at home with no parental supervision. So the gender roles in the Arab American family are very much centered on family stability. This, by the way, is not unlike other ethnic and immigrant groups who come here from other parts of the world and are very interested in maintaining a cultural identity. That's not to say they don't want to blend or be American, but rather that they want to hold on to some sense of who they are. One way to do that is to maintain a, a, a tight-knit family, whether it be an extended family or whether it be a small family, that, that's irregardless, but rather to maintain belief systems and cultural ideas. So guess what? If both people are working and have careers, someone's not home taking care of the kids. Someone's not home teaching them about their language and their religion and their food, cultural you know, practices. So part of it is the idea that in our current society, both men and women tend to have careers. In 
the Arab American community, there's a strong um, preference for women to stay home if there's young children in the home. So it's really sort of an interesting paradox. And in some ways, my results tend to reify this idea that, well, women are at home and not in the public sphere. At the same time, it also speaks to the fact that we value, you know, having well-raised children in, in our society. Um, and then the women often do enter the labor force, but it's after the kids are, are grown or at least out of the sort of the preschool years. Very good. Viewers can join this Duke Office Hours conversation in three ways, by emailing live at duke.edu, visiting the Duke University Facebook page, or using the Twitter tag, Duke Live. We have an email question here from Beth, who's asking about the role clothing plays, and especially the hijab, and making visible differences for Muslims in terms of culture and lifestyle. She references other groups, Amish or Hasidic Jews, that also have different dress. So what about this issue of, uh, of the hajib and a difference in dress in terms of uh, perception of differences about uh, Muslim Americans? I, I think the issue of the hijab is one of the most uh, confusing, it's the most hotly debated, uh, the most misunderstood, as far as I can tell, uh, of all issues related to anything Middle Eastern, whether it be Arab or Muslim or other. Uh, you know, um, one of my very first research projects was looking at the the practice of wearing the hijab here in the United States, and I, I looked at Muslim women who did wear it and Muslim women who didn't, because I was very interested in what did this symbol of clothing mean? And this was prior to 9-11. And, and what I found is it has a diversity of meanings. Um, and it does not mean these women are oppressed. And I had some fascinating quotes from a lot of the women who wore it who said, you know, it is a symbol of my identity. Uh, one woman said, Muslim women uh, wear the hijab, American women wear the bikini. Um, a lot of them expressed that they felt it provided them with some sense of uh, respect, that they were treated uh, based on their um, intellect and not just based on their looks. So in other words, they weren't objectified in terms of the American standards of beauty. Um, so it was, it was an interesting study that I did. After 9-11, I went back because there was this interesting phenomenon that happened, which was a huge uptick in the number of second-generation Muslim immigrant youth, women, uh, starting to wear the hijab. Now, let me break that down. By second generation, I mean born in the United States, grown up here their entire lives, a lot of them were in their late teens, early 20s, did not wear the hijab before 9-11, but started wearing it after. Um, I had two students who were working for me on a project um, at the time who were not wearing the hijab, and they started wearing it, much to the dismay of their family, which, again, goes against the stereotype that this is something that's forced on these Muslim women. That's not the case at all, by and large, especially in the United States. And when I asked them, why would you do this right after 9-11 when there's such heightened tension? Uh, and many of them said, you know, I'm an American. I've always been an American. I was born and raised here. But the treatment I've received after 9-11 makes me feel like I'm not a part of America. So they were searching for an identity that they could feel like they fit. Uh, another woman said to me, well, you know, I've got friends who liked me before 9-11, but now are sort of don't know what to do with me because I'm Muslim. They, so she said, I want to show them that I can be a good Muslim, a good American, and still a good friend. So it was a very interesting dynamic, but I think it is very, very um, misunderstood by and large in terms of what it means. Uh, and it means something different here in the U.S. to different communities than it even does in different countries in the Middle East, where there are laws prohibiting it in some places, laws demanding it in others. Um, so it requires a deeper look into what the hijab means for the women themselves in the different contexts in which they're wearing them. Very good. Professor Reed, we've got a question that's come in here by email from David. In talking about Muslim issues, he wants to know about other professors at Duke studying uh, Islam and Muslim issues and what those conversations are that you're having with your colleagues here at the university. 
Well, Duke has a vibrant uh, community. I've, I've just finished my first year here, and one of the things that attracted me was the fact they've got the Duke Islamic um, Study Center, of which I'm a member, which is uh, a conglomerate, a lot of Duke faculty from different departments, from, from religion, from history, from economics, from sociology and global health. So depending on the day, there's a different conversation about Islam uh, going on on campus, and it's, it's fascinating. You know, we have taught the, if you're interested, go to DISC's website, but they have talks on contemporary Islam, both in the Middle East and in the U.S. They have historical talks. Um, and a, a nice thing is they also have a, a sort of relationship with the UNC, so they pull on other faculty as well to sort of offer, I think, uh, the Triangle community, one of the richest places, if you're interested in studying anything to do with Islam, both historically and currently, uh, a place where someone can go and ask questions and be told answers and given evidence of where those answers came from. And I think, and given the contentiousness of this topic, that's a real uh, plus. Very good. Viewers can join this Duke Office Hours conversation in three ways. By emailing live at duke.edu, visiting the Duke University Facebook page, or using the Twitter tag Duke Live. Professor Reed, as your research develops, what sort of effect or impact do you hope that it has as it's received by your colleagues and by a wider public or even actions that would, people would take based upon it? Well, there's at least three things I hope come from it. One is I hope it spurns a new generation of scholars to ask more questions about this group. I recall when I was doing my graduate work and I started studying Arab Americans, um, I'll leave names out of it because they're still friends of mine, but my mentors were like, why are you studying this population? They're so small, nobody cares. And from a purely population-based perspective, that may be true. They were a relatively small group relative to other ethnic and immigrant groups in the country. Of course, after 9-11 came, it didn't matter what their size was. They clearly had an import in terms of understanding who they were. So one of the things I'm hoping to do is you know, make more information available to other, you know, young scholars out there who are interested in understanding who Muslim and Arabs are. I think we've got a lot of people who are interested in it, but not enough people doing research on the area, particularly comparative research, research that says, okay, well, how do Muslims look relative to Christians? Or how do Arab Muslims look relative to African American Muslims? Something that allows us to understand better the experiences that they're having. So that's one academic, I guess, if you would, uh, outcome that I have hope to, that comes of this. The second is more in the policy arena, where I hope to influence the people who have an import on the lives of Muslims both here and abroad. I've spent a lot of time researching these communities and I think the things that I find don't always sit well with the policies that are actually passed in terms of addressing these groups. So I hope to continue to push forward and provide more information that's elucidating to people who are in the position uh, to affect the lives of, of Muslims and Arabs both here and abroad. Great, Professor Reed. Thank you for holding these office hours. Uh, concluding remarks about who our Muslim neighbors are here in America, ways if we want to know more about Muslims here in America, action points. I would say, you know, find a Muslim neighbor. There's a good chance that there's Muslims out there that you don't know. And knowing a Muslim typically means that you know more about Islam and it overcomes a lot of the prejudices and stereotypes out there. And I think it's really important as a country that we embrace the people who are here that don't mean us harm uh, and at least in our minds separate those from those who do. Thanks so much. The conversation continues online. Email live at duke.edu, visit the Duke University Facebook page, or use the Twitter tag Duke Live. To learn more about Duke, visit duke.edu.